Okay, we're on to lecture number nine. Uh, the last lectures we talked about the strong equivalent principle implies a gravitational redshift and the gravitational time dilation. And we're going to continue this in section uh, 4.3. We're going to talk about now gravitational deflection of light. <coughs> uh, basically, we're pointing that the gravitational time dilation can lead to light deflection. And uh, <coughs> we said the equivalent principle implies that the clock runs at different rates at gravitational locations. But this way, because speed is measured with time, so therefore you can get different speed measurements uh, <coughs> because of different clock rates. So even light speed can measure to have different values. It all depends what kind of clock you use. <coughs> now, then you say, well, does that mean the speed light uh, is no longer a fixed number? Well, <coughs> what's invariant doesn't matter. It's always true is that the light speed is measured by a local observer. The proper time, then the speed is always equal to the universal constant C. Okay. <coughs> In the present gravity, the usual time coordinate is chosen to be the measured by the clock that's far away from the source of gravity. So therefore, the fact that the coordinate time, it was the time chosen far away from gravity, is different from the proper time, which is cho chosen locally. And uh, <coughs> so therefore, speeds measured with respect to the coordinate time were different from C. So we can talk about talk about a time a position dependent speed. <clears throat> we have the gravitational time dilation formula, the uh, the rate measured by clock at different locations one and two depends on the gravitational potential at those two point phi one and phi two. Now if we choose point two to be our reference point, same as phi two uh, we define phi two equal to zero then the, the time measured at that point uh, for, for a clock located at that point will have a rate which is defined to be the uh, <coughs> the coordinate time rates, so dt. So therefore this formula, let me call it the point 1, it's more interesting, so I'm not going to write subscript, so d tau equal to minus this d, uh, dt over d tau is equal to phi y, which is called phi, minus t is 0 c squared. So divide by d tau by d tau, that's 1. So therefore, 1, if phi over c squared move from right-hand side to the left-hand side, and then it's equal to dt over d tau. If we invert this formula, it will divide, <coughs> take the inverse. So d tau dt, then it's 1 over minus phi over there, which the so leading approximation is 1 plus phi over c squared. Now, we talk about the speed of light measured with respect to the coordinate time dr dt, which I can div multiply d tau on numerator and denominator, so it can become uh, d tau over dt, dr over d tau. But dr over d tau is just by definition equals c, it's constant c, and d tau over dt, which is derived, is equal to 1 plus phi over c squared. So therefore, we we have a position because phi is position dependent, so we have a position dependent speed of light. Okay, and uh, <coughs> and and it's because gravitational potential is negative, so this value is less than one. So the 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 speed of light measured by core time is less than the, than the c. So the light appears to slow down. Now, the most dramatic example, which we will discuss in Chapter 7, is that this, this coordinate dependent speed can be zero for a black hole, so that the light can never escape to remote observer, even though the proper time for a local observer is completely normal. But if you take it back to the coordinate time, it can be very different. So now we can introduce uh, the, the notion index refraction for the vacuum. 
Remember, we usually talk about the speed of light in the medium is characterized as index of refraction, which is defined to be this, the speed in a vacuum divided by the speed in the medium, which can be position dependent. So therefore, the index refraction can be position dependent. <laughs> in equal principle, the presence of gravity, even the vacuum can have an effect index refraction because, as I said, we just calculated last page, uh, C of R over C is, uh, which is 1 over R, is 1 plus 5 over C squared. So this in, you have an index refraction that uh, uh, depends on positions. Remember, if an index, if an index refraction position dependent can lead to light deflection, uh, the familiar example for diffraction, if going from a medium with index n to a medium with a different one, so n prime is not equal to n, the light can bend uh, because that's a sudden jump of index refraction. But if index refraction uh, depends on r, not so broad, but just gradually depends on r, then we just get a usual uh, deflection bending. We can calculate the deflection using Huygens' construction of I remember you have a wave, you take, consider a wavefront, and you treat each point on the wavefront to be sourced as spherical wavelets. And then you take the tangent of the wavelets to get the next wavefront. So basically, the radius of the wavelets is C times delta T, uh, dt. So therefore, in this case, for example, a plane wave, where if this C is same everywhere, then it will just lead to a parallel wavefront, and it gets straightforward. A straight propagation of light. However, if the velocity light is position dependent, say let's say at this on the upper part C1 is bigger than C2, then the wavelets radius is bigger here and the here. So therefore, when you draw the tangent for the wavelets, you get a tilted uh, wavefront. So tilted by angle d phi. Okay. Uh, be careful, we're talking lowercase phi, that's for the angle. For the uppercase phi, we talk gravitational potential. Don't, don't think you're confused with this one. So anyway, using Huygens' principle, we want to find how a changing of speed or, or position-dependent index refraction will lead to a, a <coughs> wavefront to be tilted, so therefore to a bending of light. So now we talk about a transverse field, which means the field is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So d phi, <coughs> dy is not equal to zero. So therefore, we can calculate this infinitesimal deflection angle, d phi. It's different because of the c1 and the c2 here, because so c1 t minus c2 t. So that's the difference here. This, this, this is here, divided by dy. dy is this direction. So therefore, for a small angle where the tangent side is the same, it's just uh, d phi. Or I can write this, the difference is just differential of c, uh, and t is equal to uh, the, the propagation is from um, dx, t, dx by c, divided by c is equal to dt. Now, <coughs> Since the, uh, the differential dc over dc over r over c, which is the differential of the one over index refraction, uh, is equal to just differential this this expression here, uh, is just equal to differential of the gravitational potential over c squared. So therefore, uh, this angle infinitesimal angle deflection is equal to. <coughs> Uh, dc over c, so that's d phi over c squared, and c of dy, and then multiply by this uh, t, what's left of dx. Now, d phi dy simply means a change in direction in the y direction, so therefore it's a gradient projected in the y direction. y is the unit vector here. Okay. So, <clears throat> so using Huygens construction, we find that that's the infinitesimal angle deflection is the gradient project in the direction of the, the gradient of the gravitational field uh, divided by c squared times the, the amount the propagates dx. Now here we use the index refraction, but actually you know, in this calculation, it just basically you don't have to introduce n, you just c r over c, 
uh, can carry the whole calculation through. So we really, really don't need to introduce it. But we we introduce simply just to connect to something you are familiar with. Okay, you, you knew this uh, <coughs> diffraction from elementary physics book uh, because the changing of index refraction or change of speed leads to bending of the light. So this is uh, an infinitesimal diffraction, and we, we derived the last slides, and we're not going to calculate the, the finite angle diffraction, but accumulate the effect. And the, uh, so it was, I have a source like here, which will be bent by the diffraction, and the reach as the observer here. Now, for an observer, of course, we did not realize light had bent. We thought light is always straight, so we thought the source is located here. Okay, so if you have an angle diffraction del phi, you will think the source is located at S prime instead of S. Now, how to calculate it, which is, means adding up all the infinitesimal deflections here. Here is M, M is the source of light, for example, the sun. And, and at any point along the trajectory, I can either label it by uh, x, y, or label by r and theta. R and theta, and the, and the two relations. Okay. So uh, here is the closest point approach is R sub mean. Okay, the x y direction. That's the key. Now, if we're working with a spherical source, for example, the sun, the gravitational potential is minus g m over R, and the gradient of is equal to g m over R square okay, in the radial direction. Since most bending take place when it's closest to the source, so when R is close to R mean, so we can take phi to be a transverse, basically just in this direction, Y direction, transverse direction. So now we add up, we integrate over all the uh, infinite, infinitesimal deflection angle over the whole path. Okay, so if I substitute the result here, <coughs> D phi is equal to delta gravitational the gradient of gravity potential project into the y direction and the uh, integrate from, from x from minus x to plus x. Okay, minus. And now I substitute the gradient ex expression for the gradient of gravity potential is gm over r square over here, and which is the radial direction of so r dot y, uh, unit vector r dot unit vector y over r square here. <clears throat> but r dot y over r is that simply equal to y <coughs> over r, so so it's y over r cubed, and, uh, because r dot y is cosine theta, cosine theta is y over r. <coughs> now. Uh, for R in general, of course, it's equal to x squared plus y squared square root. But since most uh, the, the most contribution came with y near the infinitesimal, uh, including the minimal R, so we're going to just approximate by replace the whole y by R sub mean. So therefore, the, the finite deflection angle equal to gm over c squared, y replaced by R I mean, and the R is equal to so it's x squared plus R mean squared to the Q who so three half power. This is just a, a standard integral. Okay. Either you can do it or just look at the table and the, you get the result. So the equivalent principle predicts a finite deflection angle of 2 gm over c squared R mean. Okay, which this integral is 2 over R mean. Now, as it turns out, Einstein obtained this result in 1911 using the equivalent principle. When 1915, when he developed the full GR theory, and then he calculated the deflection angle, it turned out to be is twice as much as equivalent principle. Anyway, equivalent principle somehow missed half of the, the value. <coughs> and this result, the GR result, of course, confirmed a few years later in the famous 1919 a solar eclipse observation by Eddington and company. And the, the question, why is this factor two? 
turns out because we talk about gravitational time dilation uh, using a cooling principle, turns out when you took the full space time curve space time into account, there's not only there's the gravitational time dilation, there's also gravitational length contraction, which contribute equal amount, so therefore it's twice as much. Now <clears throat> you say, well, can you derive the gravitational length contraction through equivalent principle? You can't wave your hand, you can't, but it's uh, ultimately really you have to assume it's curved space and time because otherwise there are all, all kinds of ambiguities. It's, it's hard. Uh, so therefore I ignore talking about gravitational length contract in the context of equivalent principle, just concentrate on gravitational time dilation as predicted by equivalent principle. Now, <clears throat> Bending light uh, gravitational ratio, uh, so it sounds like there's, a, so we say there's a gravitating light, light affected by gravity. Uh, it'd be careful in how we interpret the, the results. Okay, uh, so whenever we say there's a light gets redshift when climbing out of gravitational field, and in fact it's attracted to the center of gravity in the tra light trajectory, all sounds like it's very tempting to attribute a gravitational mass to light because that's there's a light uh, mass which will be behaving as gravitational field. In fact, uh, there's a break exercise or actually using the, the concept of gravitational mass to derive the gravitational uh, redshift. It's very simple, uh, very easy to derive. But the point I want to say, you have to be very careful. In fact, in some sense, it's incorrect. Okay. For the gravitational deflection of light, Turns out the result is the same as, as Newtonian theory. In the Newton theory of light, we also predict a, a, a light deflection, and by the same amount as predicted by the equivalent principle. Okay. In fact, when 1919 solar eclipse uh, came to the news, uh, the popular press usually say Einstein was right, Newton's wrong. Basically, it was comparing Einstein's result, GI result, with Newton's rule, not talking current principle, because that's too hard to explain. Uh, <clears throat> so, in what sense, this is Newton's result? If you look up any books on mechanics, uh, you'll find uh, central force problem of a particle scattered by uh, a spherical gravitational source. You find that angle scattering uh, uh, is equal to 2 gm, the velocity of the particle being scattered over our mean, which is independent of the particle mass, it's only the source mass, okay, U.S. particle velocity. Now, if in Newton theory, there's no such thing as uh, if the particle has to travel at, uh, <coughs> because there's no limit. So in principle, if the particle can be traveled at the speed of light, it was light is a particle in Newton theory anyway. So so if you just put u equal to c, and that of course just give you this result, which is the equivalent principle result. So in that sense, this result, the equivalent principle result, is the same as that's given by Newton theory. And I would say GR result is twice as much. Okay. First, we'll take a break, uh, do an exercise uh, to show how the idea of using gravitational mass you can easily derive the gravitational. Redshift. <coughs>